Chapter Seventeen of Bill Nye's Cordwood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bruce Gachuk. Bill Nye's Cordwood by Bill Nye. Bill Nye on Railroads. Perhaps there is nothing in the line of discovery and improvement that has shown more marked progress in the last century than the railway and its different auxiliaries. When we remember that much less than a century has passed since the first patent for a locomotive to move upon a track was issued, where now we have everything that heart can wish, and in fact live better on the road than we do at home, with but thirty-six hours between New York and Minneapolis, and a gorgeous parlor, bedroom, and dining room between Maine and Oregon, with nothing missing that may go to make life a rich blessing, we are compelled to express our wonder and admiration. To Peter Cooper is largely due the boom given to railway business, he having constructed the first locomotive ever made in this country, and put it on the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. The first train ever operated must have been a grand sight. First came the locomotive, a large Babcock fire extinguisher on trucks, with a smokestack like a full-blown speaking tube, with a frill around the top. The engineer at his post in a plug hat, with an umbrella over his head and his hand on the throttle, borrowing a chew of tobacco now and then of the farmers who passed him on their way to town. Near him stood the fireman, now and then bringing in an armful of wood from the fields through which he passed and turning the damper in the smokestack every little while, so it would draw. Now and then he would go forward and put a pork rind on a hot box, or pound on the cylinder head to warn people off the track. Next comes the tender, loaded with nice white birch wood, an economical style of fuel because its bark may be easily burned off, while the wood itself will remain uninjured. Besides the firewood, we find on the tender a barrel of rainwater and a tall blond jar with wicker work around it, which contains a small sprig of tansy immersed in four gallons of New England rum. This the engineer has brought with him for use in case of accident. He is now engaged in preparing for the accident in advance. Next comes the front brakeman, in a plug hat about two sizes too large for him. He also wears a long-waisted frock coat with a bustle to it and a tall shirt collar with a table-spread tie, the ends of which flutter gaily in the morning breeze. As the train pauses at the first station, he takes a hammer out of the toolbox and nails on the tire of the four-wheel of his coach. The engineer gets down with a long oil can and puts a little sewing machine oil on the pitman. He then wipes it off with his sleeve. It is now discovered that the rear coach, containing a number of directors and the division superintendent, is missing. The conductor goes to the rear of the last coach and finds that the string by which the director's car was attached is broken, and that, the grade being pretty steep, the directors and one brakeman have no doubt gone back to the starting place. But the conductor is cool. He removes his bell-crowned plug hat, and taking out his orders and time card, he finds that the track is clear, and looking at a large valuable Waterbury watch, presented to him by a widow whose husband was run over and killed by the train, he sees he can still make the next station in time for dinner. He hires a livery team to go back after the director's coach, and calling all aboard, he swings lightly upon the moving train. It is now ten o'clock, and nineteen weary miles still stretch out between him and the dinner station. To add to the horrors of the situation, the front brakeman discovers that a very thirsty boy in the emigrant car has been drinking from the water supply tank on the tender, and there is not enough left to carry the train through. Much time is consumed in filling the barrel again at a spring near the track, but the conductor finds a spotter on the train and gets him to do it. He also induces him to cut some more wood and clean out the ashes. The engineer then pulls out a drawhead and begins to make up time. In twenty minutes he has made up an hour's time, though two miles of hoop iron are torn from the track behind him. He sails into the eating station on time, and while the master mechanic takes several of the coach wheels over to the machine shop to soak, he eats a hurried lunch. 
the brakeman here gets his tin lanterns ready for the night run and fills two of them with red oil to be used on the rear coach the fireman puts a fresh bacon rind on the eccentric stuffs some more cotton batting around the axles puts a new linchpin in the hind wheels sweeps the apple peelings out of the smoking car and he is ready then comes the conductor with his plug hat full of excursion tickets orders passes and time checks he looks at his waterbury watch waves his hand and calls all aboard again it is upgrade however and for two miles the spotter has to push behind with all his might before the conductor will allow him to get on and ride thus began the history of a gigantic enterprise which has grown till it is a comfort a convenience a luxury and yet a necessity it has built up and beautified the desert it has crept beneath the broad river scaled the snowy mountain and hung by iron arms from the cannon and the precipice carrying the young to new lands and reuniting those long separated it has taken the hopeless to lands of new hope it has evaded the solitude of the wilderness spiked down valuable land grants killed cheap cattle and then paid a high price for them whooped through valleys snorted over lofty peaks crept through long dark tunnels turning the bright glare of day suddenly upon those who thought the tunnel was two miles long roared through the night and glittered through the day bringing alike the groom to his beautiful bride and the weeping prodigal to the moss-grown grave of his mother you are indeed a heartless soulless corporation and yet you are very essential in our business end of bill nye on railroads chapter eighteen of bill nye's cordwood this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bruce Kachuk. Bill Nye's Cordwood by Bill Nye. Bill Nye's Letter. How Old Brindle Met Her Death with a Train. A quaint epistle in which the humorist gives his experience with railroad officials. How he secured pay for a cow. Dear Henry, your letter stating that you had just succeeded in running your face for a new curriculum is at hand and contents noted as the feller said when i wrote to him two years ago and told him that his cussed railroad had mashed old brin you remember that just as you entered on what you called your junior year old brin remained out all night and your mother and me took our coffee milkless in the morning well i went down to the pound to see if she had registered there but she hadn't been stopping there the night clerk said he maintained however that number two ought eight as he called it had come in half an hour late with a cow's head on the pilot and brindle hair on the running gears of the tender so i went over to the station and found brin's head there whereupon i went down the track in search of her though i feared it would be futile as you once said about administering a half sole to your summer pantaloons well i was right about it henry if i'd been in the futile business for years i couldn't have been more so than i was on this occasion the old cow was dead and so identified with the right of way that her own mother would not have known her i spoke to the conductor about it and he said it wasn't on his run and for me to see the other conductor time i found him he was on another road and killed in a collision with a lumber train then i wrote to the general traffic manager using great care to spell all the words as near right as possible and he didn't reply at all his hired man wrote me however with a printing press that my letter had been received and contents duly noted in reply would say that the general traffic manager was then attending a tripartite reunion at chicago at which meeting the subject of cows would come up he said that there had been such competition between the milwaukee the northwestern and the rock island in the matter of prices paid for shattered cows that farmers got to dragging their debilitated stock on the track at night and selling it to the roads after which they would retire from business on their ill-gotten gains when the general traffic manager got back i went in to see him he was very pleasant with me but said he had nothing to do with the dead cow industry 
go to the auditor or the general solicitor said he they run the morgue but they were both away attending a large eastern mass meeting of auditors and general solicitors where they were discussing the practicability of a new garnishy proof pay car that some party had patented they said so i went home and wrote to the auditor a nice long fluent letter in relation to the cow and her merits i told him that it wasn't the intrinsic value of the cow that i cared about intrinsic value is a term that i found in one of your letters and liked very much i wrote him that old brin was an heirloom and a noble brute i said among other things that she had never been antagonistic to railroads she had rather favored them also that her habits and tastes were simple and that she had never aspired to rise above her station in life and why she should rise higher than the station when she was injured i could not understand i told him what a good milkster she was and also that she came up every night as regular as an emetic i then wrote my name with a little ornamental squirm to it added a postscript in which i said that you was now in your junior year and i thought that about seventy-five dollars would be a fair quotation on such a cow as i had feebly described and said good-bye to him hoping he would remit at a prior date if possible i got a letter after a while stating that my favor of the twenty-fifth alt or prox or something of that nature had been duly received and contents noted this was no surprise to me because that is too often the sad fate of a letter in fact the same thing had happened to the other one i had previously sent i was mad and wrote to the president of the company stating in crisp language that if his company would pay more cash for cows and do less in the noting and contents business he would be more apt to endear himself to those who reside along his line and who had their horses scared to death twice a day by his arrogant and bellering besom of destruction if you will deal more in scads and less in stenography and monkey business says i in closing you will warm yourself into the hearts of the plain people otherwise i says we will arise in our might and walk i then in a humorsome way marked it dictated letter and sent it away i got it back in the face by way of the dead letter office where they know me i'll bet they had a good laugh over it for they opened it and read it while it was there i wouldn't be surprised if every man in congress had a good hearty laugh over that letter congressmen enjoy a good thing once in a while henry they ain't so dumb as they look but i finally got my pay for old brin to make a long story short they cut me down some on the price but i finally got my money no railroad company can run over a cow of mine and mix her up with a trestle three-quarters of a mile long without paying for it and favors received and contents duly noted don't go with your father bill nye End of Bill Nye's Letter How Old Brindle Met Her Death with a Train Chapter 19 of Bill Nye's Cordwood This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bruce Kachuk bill nye's cordwood by bill nye bill nye attends a western theater and sees a remarkable shooting affray those were troublesome times indeed when we were trying to settle up the new world and a few other matters at the same time little do the soft-eyed sons of prosperity understand today as they walk the paved streets of the west under the cold glitter of the electric light surrounded by all that can go to make life sweet and desirable that not many years ago on that same ground their fathers fought the untutored savage by night and chased the bounding buffalo by day all all is changed time in his restless and resistless flight has filed away those early years in the county clerk's office and these times are not the old times with the march of civilization i notice that it is safer for a man to attend a theater than in the early days of the wild and woolly west time has made it easier for one to go to the opera and bring his daylights home with him than it used to be it seems but a few short years since my roommate came home one night with a long red furrow ploughed along the top of his head 
where some gentleman at the theatre had shot him by mistake. My roommate said that a tall man had objected to the pianist and suggested that he was playing pianissimo when he should have played fortissimo, and trouble grew out of this which had ended in the death of the pianist and the injury of several disinterested spectators. And yet the excitement of knowing that you might be killed at any moment made the theatre more attractive, and instead of scaring men away, it rather induced patronage. Of course it prevented the attendance of ladies who were at all timid, but it did not cause any falling off in the receipts. Some thought it aided a good deal, especially where the show itself didn't have much blood in it. The Bella Union was a pretty fair sample of the theatre in those days. It was a low wooden structure with a perpetual band on the outside that played gay and festive circus tunes early and often. Inside you could poison your soul at the bar and see the show at one and the same price of admission. In an adjoining room silent men joined the hosts of Faro, and the timid tenderfoot gambled o'er the green. I visited this place of amusement one evening in the capacity of a reporter for the paper. I would not admit this even at this late day, only that it has been overlooked in Mr. Talmage since, and if he could go through such an ordeal in the interests of humanity, I might be forgiven for going there professionally to write up the show for our amusement column. The program was quite varied. Negro minstrelsy, sleight of hand, opera bouffe, high tragedy, and that oriental style of quadrille called the can-can, if my sluggish memory be not at fault, form the principal attractions of the evening. At about ten-thirty or eleven o'clock the can-can was produced upon the stage. In the midst of it a tall man rose up at the back of the hall and came firmly down the aisle with a large earnest revolver in his right hand. He was a powerfully built man with a dyed moustache and wicked eye on each side of his thin red nose. He threw up the revolver with a little click that sounded very loud to me, for he had stopped right behind me and rested his left hand on my shoulder as he gazed over on the stage. I could distinctly hear his breath come and go, for it was a very loud breath, with the odor of onions and emigrant whiskey upon it. The orchestra paused in the middle of a snort, and the man whose duty it was to swallow the clarionet pulled seven or eight inches of the instrument out of his face and looked wildly around. The gentleman who had been agitating the feelings of the bass viol laid it down on the side, crawled in behind it, and spread a sheet of music over his head. The stage manager came forward to the footlights and inquired what was wanted. The tall man with the self-cocking credentials answered simply, By dashity blank to blank blank and back again, I want my wife. The manager stepped back into the wings for a moment, and when he came forward he also had a large musical instrument, such as Mr. Remington used to make before he went into the typewriter business. I can still remember how large the hole in the barrel looked to me, and how I wished that I had gone to the meeting of the literary club that evening, as I had at first intended to do. Literature was really more in my line than the drama. I still thought that it was not too late, perhaps, and so I rose and went out quietly so as not to disturb anyone, and as I went down the aisle the tall man and the stage manager exchanged regrets. I looked back in time to see the tall man fall in the aisles, with his face in the sawdust and his hand over his breast. Then I went out of the theatre in an aimless sort of way, taking a northeasterly direction as the crow flies. I do not think I ran over a mile or two in this way before I discovered that I was going directly away from home. I rested a while and then returned. On the street I met the stage manager and the tall dark man, just as they were coming out of the Moss Agate Saloon. They said they were very sorry to notice that I got up and came away at a point in the program where they had introduced what they had regarded as the best feature of the show. This incident had a great deal to do with turning my attention in the direction of literature instead of the drama. But I am glad to notice that many of the horrors of the drama are being gradually eliminated as the country gets more thickly settled and the gory tragedy of a few years ago is gradually giving place to the refining influences of the tin soldier and a rag baby. End of Bill Nye Attends a Western Theatre and Sees a Remarkable Shooting Affray Chapter Number 20 of Bill Nye's Corwood This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Bill Nye's Cordwood by Bill Nye Favored a Higher Fine The Boy Who Made a Dollar by a Whipping Will Taylor, the son of the present American consul at Marseilles, was a good deal like other boys while at school, in his old home in Hudson, Wisconsin. One day he called his father into the library and said, Pa, I don't like to tell you, but the teacher and I have had trouble. What's the matter now? Well, I cut one of the desks a little with my knife, and the teacher says I've got to pay one dollar or take a lickin'. Well, why don't you take the lickin' and say nothing more about it? I can stand considerable physical pain as long as it visits our family in that form. Of course, it is not pleasant to be flogged, but you have broken a rule of the school, and I guess you'll have to stand it. I presume that the teacher will, in wrath, remember mercy and avoid disabling you, so that you can't get your coat on any more. But, Pa, I feel mighty bad over it already, and if you would pay my fine, I'd never do it again. A dollar isn't much to you, Pa, but it's a heap to a boy who hasn't a cent. If I could make a dollar as easily as you can, Pa, I'd never let my little boy get flogged that way to save a dollar. If I had a little feller that got licked because I didn't put up for him, I'd hate the sight of money always. I'd feel as if every dollar I had in my pocket had been taken out of my little kid's back. Well now, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll give you a dollar to save you from punishment this time. But if anything of this kind ever occurs again, I'll hold you while the teacher licks you, and then I'll get the teacher to hold you while I lick you. That's the way I feel about it. If you want to go around whittling up our educational institutions, you can do so. But you will have to purchase them afterward yourself. I don't propose to buy any more damaged furniture. You probably grasp my meaning, do you not? I send you to school to acquire an education, not to acquire liabilities, so that you can come around and make an assessment on me. I feel a great interest in you, Willie, but I do not feel as though it should be an accessible interest. I want to go on, of course, and improve the property, but when I pay my dues on it, I want to know that it goes toward development work. I don't want my assessments to go toward the purchase of a school desk with American hieroglyphics carved on it. I hope you will bear this in mind, my son, and beware. It will be greatly to your interest to beware. If I were in your place, I would put a large portion of my time in the beware business. The boy took the dollar and went thoughtfully away to school, and no more was ever said about the matter until Mr. Taylor learned casually several months later that the Spartan youth had received the walloping and filed away the one dollar for future reference. The boy was afterward heard to say that he favored a much higher fine in cases of that kind. One whipping was sufficient, he said, but he favored a fine of five dollars. It ought to be severe enough to make it an object. End of chapter 20 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter number 21 of Bill Nye's Cordwood This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Bill Nye's Cordwood by Bill Nye. How Bill Nye failed to make the amend honorable, a pathetic incident. It is rather interesting to watch the manner by which old customs have been slightly changed and handed down from age to age. Peculiarities of old traditions still linger among us and are forked over to posterity like a rappy jawed teapot or a long time mortgage. No one can explain it, but the fact still remains patent that some of the oddities of our ancestors continue to appear from time to time clothed in the changing costumes of the prevailing fashions. Along with these choice antiquities, and carrying the nut-brown flavor of the dead and relentless original amend in which the offender appeared in public, clothed only in a cotton flannel shirt and with a rope around his neck as an evidence of a former recantation, down to this day when sometimes the pale editor in a stickful of type admits that his informant was an error, the amend honorable has marched along with the easy tread of time. The blue-eyed molder of public opinion, with one suspender hanging down at his side and writing on a sheet of news copy paper, has a more extensive costume, perhaps, than the old-time offender who bowed in the dust in the midst of the great populace and with a halter under his ear admitted his offense, but he does not feel any more cheerful over it. I have been called several times to make the amend honorable, and I admit that it is not an occasion of much mirth and merriment. People who come into the editorial office to invest in a retraction are generally healthy, and have a stiff, reserved manner that no cheerfulness or hospitality can soften. I remember an incident of this kind which occurred last summer in my office while I was writing something scathing. A large man with an air of profound perspiration about him and a plaid flannel shirt stepped into the middle of the room and breathed in all the air that I was not using. He said he would give me four minutes in which to retract, and pulled out a watch by which to ascertain the exact time. I asked him if he would not allow me a moment or two to step over to a telegraph office to wire my parents of my awful death. He said I could walk out that door when I walked over his dead body. Then I waited a long time till he told me my time was up, and asked me what I was waiting for. I told him I was waiting for him to die, so that I could walk over his dead body. How could I walk over a corpse until life was extinct? He stood and looked at me, at first in astonishment, afterward in pity. Finally, tears welled up in his eyes and plowed their way down his broad and grimy face. Then he said I need not fear him. You are safe, said he. A youth who is so patient and cheerful as you are, one who would wait for a healthy man to die so you could meander over his pulseless remnants, ought not to die a violent death. A soft-eyed seraph like you, who is no more conversant with the ways of the world than that, ought to be put in a glass vial of alcohol and preserved. I came up here to kill you and throw you into the rainwater barrel, but now I know what a patient disposition you have. I shudder to think of the crime I was about to commit. End of chapter 21. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter number 22 of Bill Nye's Cordwood. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Bill Nye's Cordwood by Bill Nye Seeing a Sawmill I have just returned from a little trip up from the North Wisconsin Railway, where I went to catch a string of codfish and anything else that might be contagious. Northern Wisconsin is the place where they yank a big wet log into a mill and turn it into cash as quick as a railroad man can draw his salary out of the pay car. The log is held on a carriage by means of iron dogs while it is being worked into lumber. These iron dogs are not like those we see on the front steps of a brown stone front occasionally. They are another breed of dogs. The managing editor of the mill lays out the log in his mind and works it into dimension stuff. Shingles, bolts, slabs, edgings, two-by-fours, two-by-eights, two-by-sixes, etc., so as to use the goods to the best advantage just as a woman takes a dress pattern and cuts it so she won't have to piece the front breadths and will still have enough left to make a polonaise for last summer's gown i stood there for a long time watching the various saws and listening to the monstrous growl and wishing that i had been born a successful timber thief instead of a poor boy without a rag to my back at one of these mills not long ago a man backed up to get away from the carriage and thoughtlessly backed against a large saw that was revolving at the rate of about two hundred times a minute the saw took a large chew of tobacco from the plug he had in his pistol pocket and then began on him but there's no use going into the details. Such things are not cheerful. They gathered him up out of the sawdust and put him in a nail keg and carried him away. But he did not speak again. Life was quite extinct. Whether it was the nervous shock that killed him or the concussion of the cold saw against his liver that killed him, no one ever knew. The mill shut down a couple of hours, so that the head sawyer could file his saw, and then work was resumed once more. We should learn from this never to lean on the buzz saw when it mooteth itself all right. End of chapter 22 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter number twenty three of Bill Nye's Courtwood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, BC. Bill Nye's Courtwood by Bill Nye. How a Chinaman Rides the Untamed Bronco A Chinaman does not grab the bit of a bronco and yank it around till the noble beast can see thirteen new and peculiar kinds of fireworks, or kick him in the stomach, or knock his ribs loose, or swear at him until the firmament gets loose and begins to roll together like a scroll but he gets on the wrong side and slides into the saddle and smiles and says something like what a guinea hen would say if she got excited and tried to repeat one of Bjornsgen Bjornsson's poems backward in his native tongue. At first the bronco seems temporarily rattled, but by and by he shoots all thwart the sunny sky like a thing of life and comes down with his legs in a cluster like a bunch of asparagus this will throw a chinaman's liver into the northwest corner of his throat 
and his upper left hand duodecimo into the middle of next week but he doesn't complain he opens his mouth and breathes in all of the atmosphere the rest of the universe can spare and tickles the bronco on the starboard quarter with his cork sole the mirth-provoking movement throws the bronco into the wildest hysterics and for some minutes the spectator doesn't see anything very distinctly the autumnal twilight seems fraught with blonde bronco and pale blue shirt tail and chinaman moving in an irregular orbit and occasionally throwing off meteoric articles of apparel and prehistoric chunks of ingenious profanity of the vintage of confucius when the sky clears up a little the chinaman's hair is down and in wild profusion about his olive features his shirt flap is very much frayed like an american flag that is snapped in the breeze for thirteen weeks he finds also that he has telescoped his spinal column and jammed two ribs through the right superior duplex has two or three vertebrae floating about through his system that he doesn't know what to do with in fact the chinaman is a robust ruin while the bronco is still in a good state of preservation now the bronco humps his back up into a circumcumbent atmosphere and when he once bisects the earth's orbit and jabs his feet into the trembling earth a shapeless mass of brocaded silk and coarse black hair and taper nails and celestial shirt tails and oolong profanity and disorganized chinese remains comes down apparently from the new jerusalem and the coroner goes out on the street to get six good men and a chemist and they analyze the collection they report that the deceased has come to his death by reasons of concussion induced by a ride from the outer battlements of the suite by and by end of chapter twenty three recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter number twenty four of bill nye's courtwood this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c bill nye's courtwood by bill nye bill nye wants to know how to preserve game slippery almerst hudson wisconsin october six to the editor might i ask through the column of your justly celebrated paper if any one will give me the requisite information regarding the care of game during the winter my preserves are located on my estate here at slippery elmhurst and while i am absent lecturing in the winter in answer to the loud calls of the public i am afraid that my game may not have the proper care and that unscrupulous people may scalp my fox and poach the eggs of my pheasants besides i am rather ignorant of the care of game and i would like to be able to instruct my gamekeeper when i go away as to his duties the gamekeeper at slippery elmhurst is what might be called a self-made gamekeeper he never had any instruction in his profession aside from a slight amount of training in high low jack therefore he has won his way unassisted to the position he now occupies what i wish most of all is to understand the methods of preserving game during the winter so that when it is scarce in the spring i can take a can opener and astonish people with my own preserves my fox succeeded in getting through the summer in fine form i got him from long island 
where the sportsmen from new york had tried to hunt him for several seasons but with indifferent success he was not well broken in the first place i presume and the noise of the hounds and domesticated englishmen in full cry no doubt frightened him he is still timid and more or less afraid of the cars he shies too when i lead him past an imitation englishman he is in good health this fall however and as i got him at a low price i am greatly pleased very likely the reason he did not give good satisfaction in new york was that those who used him did not employ a good earth stopper much depends on this man of what use is an active robust and well-broken fox well started if he be permitted to get back into his hole i have employed as an earth stopper a gentleman who saws my wood during the winter and who assists us in fox hunting in the hunting season born in a quiet little rural village called martell in pierce county wisconsin he early evinced a strong love for the sport day after day he would abstain from going to school that he might go forth into the woods and study the habits of the chipmunk for five years his health was impaired to such a degree that he was not well enough to safely attend school but just barely robust enough to drag himself away to a distance of fourteen miles where he could snare suckers and try to regain his health to climb a lightning rod and skin off the copper wire for snaring purposes with him was but the work of a moment to go joyously afield day after day and drown out the gopher while other boys were compelled to gopher an education was his chief delight as a result of this course he is not a close student of books but he can skin a squirrel without the slightest embarrassment and you could wake him up suddenly out of a profound slumber and ascertain from him exactly what the best method is for draping a frog over a pickerel hook so as to produce the best and most pleasing effects such is the description of a man who by his own unaided exertions has risen to the proud position of earth stopper on my estate he is ignorant of the care of wild game however and says he has never preserved any we want to know whether it would be best to sprinkle our fox with camphor and put him down cellar or let him run in the henhouse during the winter would your readers please say also if any of them have had any experience in fox hunting what is the best treatment for a horse which has injured himself on a barbed wire fence while in rapid pursuit of the fox i have a fine fox hunter that i bought two years ago from a milkman this horse was quite high-spirited and while the hounds were in full cry one day I had to take a barbed wire fence with him this horse which i call isocles because he is one kind of a triangle went over the fence in such a manner as to catch the pit of his stomach on the barbed wire and expose his interior department and its methods to the casual spectator we put back all the stomachs we thought he was entitled to but he has not done well since that and i have often thought that possibly we did not succeed in returning all his works how many stomachs has the adult horse i am utterly and sadly ignorant in these matters and i yearn for light i certainly favor a more thorough knowledge of animal anatomy on the part of our school children every child should know how many stomachs bowels and gizzards there are in the fully equipped cow or horse nothing is more embarrassing to the true sportsman than to see his favorite horse ripped open by a barbed wire fence while in full chase 
and then not know which digestive organ should go back first or when they have all been replaced so far isocles is concerned i remember thinking at the time that we must have put back inside of his system about twice as much digestive apparatus as he had before as my earth stopper said that we had given that horse enough for a four-horse team and yet he is ill i would like to hear from any fox hunters in cook county who may have had a similar experience end of chapter twenty four recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter number twenty five of bill nye's cordwood this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c bill nye's cordwood by bill nye bill nye attends booth's hamlet last evening i went to hear mr edwin booth in hamlet i had read the play before but it was better as he gave it i think the play of hamlet is not catchy and there is a noticeable lack of local gags in it a gentleman who stood up behind me and leaned against his breath all the evening said that he thought ophelia's singing was too disconnected he is a keen observer and has seen a great many plays he went out frequently between the acts and always came back in better spirits he noticed that i wept a little in one or two places and said that if i thought that was affecting i ought to see only a farmer's daughter he drives a bus for the holden hotel here and has seen a great deal of life still he talked freely with me through the evening and told me what was coming next he is a great admirer of the drama and night after night he may be seen in the foyer accompanied only by his breath there is considerable discussion among critics as to whether hamlet was really insane or not but i think that he assumed it in order to throw the prosecution off the track for he was a very smart man and when his uncle tried to work off some of his danish prevarications on him i fully expected him to pull a card out of his pocket and present it to his royal tallness on which might have seen the legend i am something of a liar myself but i am glad he did not for it would have seemed out of character in a play like that mr booth wore a dark waterproof cloak all the evening and a sword with which he frequently killed people he was dressed in black throughout with hair of the same shade he was using the same hair in hamlet that he did twenty years ago though he uses less of it he wears black knickerbockers and long black crockless stockings mr booth is doing well in the acting business frequently getting as high as two dollars apiece for tickets to his performances he was encored by the audience several times last night but refrained from repeating the play fearing that it would make it late for those who had to go back to belladonna o after the close of the entertainment toward the end of the play a little rough on rats gets into the elderberry wine and the royal family drink it after which there is considerable excitement and a man with a good reliable stomach pump would have had all he could do several of the royal family curl up and perish they do not die in the house during an interview between hamlet and his mother an old gentleman who has the honor to be ophelia's father hides behind a picket fence 
so as to overhear the conversation he gets excited and says something in a low guttural tone of voice whereupon hamlet runs his sword through the picket fence in such a way as to bore a large hole in the old man who then dies i have heard a great many people speak the piece beginning to be or not to be but booth does it better than any one i have ever heard i once heard an elocutionist kind of a smart elocutionist as my friend the hosier poet would say this man recited to be or not to be in a manner which he said had frequently brought tears to eyes unused to weep he recited it with his right hand socked into his bosom up to the elbow and his fair hair tossed about over his brow his teeming brain which claimed to be kind of a four-horse teeming brain as it were seemed to be on fire and to all appearances he was indeed mad so were the people who listened to him he hissed it through his clenched teeth and snorted it through his ripe red nose wailed it up into the ceiling and bleated it down the aisles rolled it over and over against the rafters of his reverberating mouth handed it out in big capsules or hissed it through his puckered atomizer of a mouth wailed and bellowed like a wild and maddened tailless steer in fly time darted across the stage like a headless hen ripped the gentle atmosphere into shreds with his guinea hen voluntary bowed to us and teetered off the stage mr booth does not hoist his shoulders and settle back on his pastern jints like a man who is about to set a refractory brake on a coal car neither does he immerse his right arm in his bosom up to the second joint he seems to have the idea that hamlet spoke these lines mostly because he felt like saying something instead of doing it to introduce a set of health lift gestures and a hoarse baritone snout a head of dank hair a low mellowed union depot town of voice and a dark blue three sheet poster will not make a successful hamlet and blessed be the man who knows this without experimenting on the people till he has bunions on his immortal soul i have sent a note to mr booth this morning asking him to call at my room number six five eights and saying that i would give him my idea about the drama from a purely unpartisan standpoint but it is raining so fast now that i fear he will not be able to come End of chapter 25 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 26 of Bill Nye's Cordwood This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Bill Nye's Cordwood by Bill Nye Chapter 26 Bill Nye's Advice to a Youth About Drugs and Writing Mr. Bill Nye, Hudson, Wisconsin Dear Sir, I hope you will pardon me for addressing you on a matter of pure business, but I have heard that you are not averse to going out of your way to do a favor now and then to those who are sincere and appreciative. I have learned from a friend that you have been around all over the West, and so I have taken the liberty of writing you to ask what you think would be the chances of success for a young man if he were to go to Kansas to enter the drug business. I am a practical young druggist, twenty-three years of age, and have some money, a few hundred dollars, with which to go into business. Would you advise Kansas or Colorado as a good part of the West for that business? I have also written some for the press, but with little success. I enclose you a few slips cut from the papers in which these articles originally appeared. 
I send stamp for reply, and hope you will answer me, even though your time may be taken up pretty well by other matters. Respectfully yours, Adolph Jaynes, Lockbox, 604. Hudson, Wisconsin, October the 1st. Mr. Adolph Jaynes, Lockbox, 604. Dear Sir, Your favor of late date is at hand, and I take pleasure in writing this dictated letter to you, using the columns of the Chicago Daily News as a delicate way of reaching you. I will take the liberty of replying to your last question first, if you pardon me. And I say you would do better, no doubt at once, in a financial way, to go on with your drug business, than to monkey with literature. In the first place, your style of composition is like the present style of dress among men. It is absolutely correct and therefore it is absolutely like that of nine men out of every ten we meet. Your style of writing has a mustache on it, wears a three-button cutaway of some scotch mixture, carries a cane and wears a straight stand-up collar and scarf. It is so correct, and so exactly in conformity with the prevailing style of composition, and your thoughts are expressed so thoroughly like other people's methods of dressing up their sentences and sandpapering the soul out of what they say, that I honestly think you would succeed better by trying to subsist upon the quick sales and small profits which the drug trade ensures. Now let us consider the question of location. Seriously, you ought to look over the ground yourself. But as you have asked me to give you my best judgment on the question of preferences between Kansas and Colorado, I will say without hesitation that if you mean by the drug business the sale of sure enough drugs, medicines, paints, oils, glass, putty, toilet articles, and prescriptions carefully compounded, I would not go to Kansas at this time. If you would like to go to a flourishing country and put out a big basswood mortar in front of your shop in order to sell the tincture of damnation throughout bleeding Kansas, now is your golden opportunity. Now is the accepted time. If it is the great, big, burning desire of your heart to go into a town of two thousand people, and open the thirteenth drug store in order that you may stand behind a tall black walnut prescription case, day in and day out, with a graduate in one hand and a Babcock fire extinguisher in the other, filling orders for whiskey made of stump water, and the juice of future punishment, you will do well to go to Kansas. It is a temperance state, and no saloons are allowed there. All is quiet and orderly, and the drug business is a great success. You can run a dummy drug store there with two dozen dreary old glass bottles on the shelves, punctuated by the hand of time and the Kansas fly of the period, and with a prohibitory law at your back and a tall red barrel in the back room filled with a mixture that will burn great holes into nature's heart and make the cemetery blossom as the rose and in a few years you can sell enough of this justly celebrated preparation for household, scientific, and experimental purposes only, to fill your flabby pockets with wealth and paint the pure air of Kansas a bright and inflammatory red. If you sincerely and earnestly yearn for a field where you may go forth and garner an honest harvest from the legitimate effort of an upright soda fountain, and free an open sale of slippery elm in its unadulterated condition, I would go to some state where I would not have to enter into competition with a style of pharmacy that has the unholy instincts and ambitions of a blind pig. I would not go into the field where red-eyed ruins simply waited for a prescription blank, not necessarily for publication, but simply as a guarantee of good faith, in order that it may be bound forth from behind the prescription case and populate the poorhouses and the pauper's nettle-grown addition to the silent city of the dead. The great question of how best to down the demon rum is before the American people, and it will not be put aside until it is settled, but while this is being attended to, Mr. Jaynes, I would start a drug store farther away from the center of conflict, and go on joyously sacrificing expensive tinctures, compounds, and syrups at bedrock prices. Go on, Mr. Jaynes, dealing out to the yearning, panting public, drugs, paints, oils, glass, putty, varnish, patent medicines, and prescriptions carefully compounded, with none to molest or make afraid. But shun, oh, shun the wild-eyed pharmacopoeia that contains naught but the festering fluid so popular in Kansas. 
a compound that holds crime in solution and ruin in bulk, that shrivels up a man's gastric economy and sears great ragged holes into his immortal soul. Take this advice home to your heart, and you will ever command the hearty cooperation of yours for health, as the late Lydia E. Pinkham so succinctly said. Bill Nye End of section 26 Recording by Philip Gould Chapter 27 of Bill Nye's Cordwood this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Bill Nye's Cordwood by Bill Nye A Would-Be Hostelry Bill Nye stops at a place where two roads fork his mournful pilgrimage through desolate wilds in company with the soulful hoosier poet a tale of gloom without a ray of hope we are moving about over the country james whitcomb riley and i in the capacity of a moral and spectacular show i attend to the spectacular part of the business that is more in my line I am writing this at an imitation hotel where the roads fork. I will call it the Fifth Avenue Hotel, because the hotel at a railroad junction is generally called the Fifth Avenue, or the Gem City House, or the Palace Hotel. I stopped at an inn some years since called the Palace, and I can truly say that if it had ever been a palace it was very much run down when i visited it just as the fond parent of a white-eyed two-legged freak of nature loves to name his mentally diluted son napoleon and for the same reason that a prominent horse owner in illinois last year socked my name on a tall buckskin coloured colt that did not resemble me intellectually or physically a colt that did not know enough to go around a barbed wire fence but sought to sift himself through it into an untimely grave so this man has named his sway-backed wigwam the fifth avenue hotel it is different from the fifth avenue in many ways in the first place there is not so much travel and business in its neighbourhood. As I said before, this is where two railroads fork. In fact, that is the leading industry here. The growth of the town is naturally slow, but it is a healthy growth. There is nothing in the nature of dangerous or wildcat speculation in the advancement of this place and while there has been no noticeable or rapid advance in the principal business, there has been no falling off at all, and these roads are forking as much today as they did before the war, while the same three men, who were present for the first glad moment, are still here to witness its operation. Sometimes a train is derailed, as the papers call it, and two or three people have to remain over as we did all night it is at such a time that the fifth avenue hotel is the scene of great excitement a large codfish with a broad and sunny smile and his bosom full of rock salt is tied in the creek to freshen and fit himself for the responsible position of floor manager of the codfish ball a pale chambermaid, wearing a black jersey with large paws in it, through which she is gently percolating, now goes joyously up the stairs to make the little post office lock box rooms look ten times worse than they ever did before. She warbles a low refrain as she nimbly knocks loose the venerable dust of centuries and sets it afloat throughout the rooms all is bustle about the house 
especially the chambermaid we were put into the guest chamber here it has two atrophied beds made up of panes and counterpanes this last remark conveys to the reader the presence of a light joyous feeling which is wholly assumed on my part the door of our room is full of holes where locks have been wrenched off in order to let the coroner in last night i could imagine that i was in the act of meeting personally the famous people who have tried to sleep here and who moaned through the night and who died while waiting for the dawn i have no doubt in the world but there is quite a good-sized delegation from this hotel of guests who hesitated about committing suicide because they feared to tread the sidewalks of perdition but who became desperate at last and resolved to take their chances and they have never had any cause to regret it we washed our hands on doorknob soap wiped them on a slippery elm court plaster that had made quite a reputation for itself under the nom de plume of towel tried to warm ourselves at a pocket inkstand stove that gave out heat like a dark lantern and had a deformed elbow at the back of it the chambermaid is very versatile and waits on the table while not engaged in agitating the overworked mattresses and puny pillows upstairs in this way she imparts the odour of fried pork to the pillowcases and kerosene to the pie she has a wild nervous and apprehensive look in her eye as though she feared that some herculean guest might seize her in his great strong arms and bear her away to a justice of the peace and marry her she certainly cannot fully realize how thoroughly secure she is from such a calamity she is just as safe as she was forty years ago when she promised her aged mother that she would never elope with any one still she is sociable at times and converses freely with me at the table as she leans over my shoulder pensively brushing the crumbs into my lap with a general utility towel which accompanies her in her various rambles through the house and she asks which we would rather have tea or eggs this afternoon we will pay our bill in accordance with a lifelong custom of ours and go away to permeate the busy haunts of men it will be sad to tear ourselves away from the fifth avenue hotel at this place still there is no great loss without some small gain and at our next hotel we may not have to chop our own wood and bring it upstairs when we want to rest the landlord of a hotel who goes away to a political meeting and leaves his guests to chop their own wood and then charges them full price for the rent of a boisterous and tempest-tossed bed will never endear himself to those with whom he is thrown in contact we leave at two thirty this afternoon hoping that the two railroads may continue to fork here just the same as though we had remained End of chapter twenty seven chapter twenty eight of bill nye's cordwood this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org bill nye's cordwood by bill nye chapter twenty eight bill nye's hornets last fall i desired to add to my rare collection a large hornet's nest i had an embalmed tarantula in her porcelain lined nest and i desired to add to these the gray and airy home of the hornet i procured one of the large size after cold weather and hung it in my cabinet by a string i forgot about it until this spring 
when warm weather came something reminded me of it i think it was a hornet he jogged my memory in some way and called my attention to it memory is not located where i thought it was it seemed as though whenever he touched me he awakened a memory a warm memory with a red place all around it then some more hornets came and began to rake up old personalities i remember that one of them lit on my upper lip he thought it was a rosebud when he went away it looked like a gladiolus bulb i wrapped a wet sheet around it to take out the warmth and reduce the swelling so that i could go through the folding doors and tell my wife about it hornets lit all over me and walked around on my person i did not dare to scrape them off because they are so sensitive you have to be very guarded in your conduct toward a hornet i remember once while i was watching the busy little hornet gathering honey and june bugs from the bosom of a rose years ago i stirred him up with a club more as a practical joke than anything else and he came and lit on my sunny hair that was when i wore my own hair and he walked around through my gleaming tresses quite a while making tracks as large as a watermelon all over my head if he hadn't run out of tracks my head would have looked like a load of summer squashes i remember i had to thump my head against the smokehouse in order to smash him and i had to comb him out with a fine comb and wear a waste paper basket two weeks for a hat much has been said of the hornet but he has an odd quaint way after all that is forever new End of chapter 28 Recording by Philip Gould Chapter 29 of Bill Nye's Cordwood This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Bill Nye's Cordwood by Bill Nye a tragedy out where the blue waves come and go out where the zephyrs kiss the strand down where the damp tides ebb and flow where the ocean monkeys with the sand william the hungry rustles for his meal slim william the eldest gathers the eel up where the johnny jump up smile up where the green hills meet the sky where out from her window for many a mile she watches the blue sea dimpling lie the wife of the elist with visage grim sits in the gloaming and watches for him down in the moist and moaning sea down where the day can never come with staring eyes that can never see and lips that will ever continue dumb with eels in his breast and a large wet wave william is filling a watery grave up where the catnip is breathing hard up where the tansy is flecked with dew where the vesper soft as the onion peels wakens the echoes the twilight through the new-made widow still watches the shore and sits there and waits as i said before they come and tell her the pitiful tale with trembling voice and tear-dimmed eye they watch her cheek grow slightly pale yet wonder at the calm reply all our tears are but idle gentlemen Go bring in the eels and set him again. End of A Tragedy Chapter 30 of Bill Nye's Cordwood This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Bill Nye's Cordwood by bill nye the bronco cow bill nye undertakes to milk her when this sign is not right disastrous results when i was young and used to roam around over the country gathering watermelons in the dark of the moon i used to think i could milk anybody's cow but i do not think so now i do not milk a cow now unless the sign is right and it hasn't been right for a good many years the last cow i tried to milk was a common cow born in obscurity kind of a self-made cow i remember her brow was low but she wore her tail high 
and she was haughty oh so haughty i made a commonplace remark to her one that is used in the very best of society one that need not have given offence anywhere i said so and she sewed then i told her to hist and she histed but i thought she overdid it she put too much expression in it just then i heard something crash through the window of the barn and fall with a dull sickening thud on the outside the neighbors came to see what it was that caused the noise they found that i had done it in getting through the window i asked the neighbors if the barn was still standing they said it was then i asked if the cow was injured much they said she seemed to be quite robust then i requested them to go in and calm the cow a little and see if they could get my plug hat off her horns i am buying all my milk now of a milkman i select a gentle milkman who will not kick and i feel as though i could trust him then if he feels as though he could trust me it is all right End of the Bronco Cow Chapter 31 of Bill Nye's Cordwood This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Bill Nye's Cordwood by Bill Nye Autumn Thoughts there can be nothing sadder than the solemn hush of nature that precedes the death of the year the golden glory of autumn with the billowy bronze and velvet azure of the skies above the royal robes of oak and maple bespeak the closing hours of nature's teeming life and the silent farewell to humanity's gauze underwear thus while nature dons her regal robe of scarlet and gold in honor of the farewell benefit to autumn the sad-eyed poet hies away to a neighboring clothesline and the hour of nature's grand blowout dons the flaming flannels of his friend out of respect for the hectic flush of the dying year leaves have their time to fall and so has the price of coal and yet how sadly at variance with decaying nature is the robust coal market another glorious summer with its wealth of pleasant memories is stored away among the archives of our history another gloomy winter is upon us these wonderful colors that flame across the softened sky of indian summer like the gory banner of royal conqueror come but to warn us that in a few short weeks the water pipe will be bursted in the kitchen and the decorated wash bowl be broken we flit through the dreamy hours of summer like swift-winged bumblebees amid the honeysuckle and pumpkin blossoms storing away perhaps a little glucose honey and buckwheat pancakes for the future but all at once like a newspaper thief in the night the king of frost and ripe mellow chilblains is upon us and we crouch beneath the wintry blast and hump our spinal column up into the crisp air like a texas steer that has thoughtlessly swallowed a raw cactus life is one continued round of alternate joys and sorrows today we are on the top wave of prosperity and warming ourselves in the glad sunlight of plenty and tomorrow we are cast down and depressed financially and have to stand off the washerwoman for our clean shirt or stay at home from the opera the november sky already frowns down upon us and its frozen tears begin to fall the little birds have hushed their little lay so has the fatigued hen only a little while and the yawning chasm in the cold calm features of the thanksgiving turkey will be filled with voluptuous stuffing and then sewed up the florid features of the polygamous gobbler will be wrapped in sadness and cranberry pie will be a burden for the veal cutlet goeth to its long home and the ice cream freezer is broken in the woodhouse o oh, time thou bald-headed pelican with a venerable corn-cutter and the second-hand hour-glass thou playest strange pranks upon the children of men no one would think 
to look at thy billows countenance and store teeth that in thy bony bosom lurk such eccentric schemes chubby boy whose danger signal hangs sadly through the lattice work of his pants knows that time who waits for no man will one day if we struggle heroically on give him knowledge and suspenders and a solid girl and experience and soft white moustache and eventually a low grave in the valley beneath the sighing elms and the weeping willow where in the misty twilight of the year noiselessly upon his breast shall fall the dead leaf while the silent tear of the grey autumnal sky will come and sink into the yellow grass above his head bill nye End of autumn thoughts Chapter thirty two of Bill Nye's Cordwood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by L.T. Bill Nye's Cordwood by Bill Nye. Chapter thirty two Bill Nye's Advice Bag. Anxious questions answered. President Cleveland's chilling neglect of an editor denounced, the woman in the sleeping coach, calm reasoning dealt out, answers to correspondence. Ghoulish Glee Bucyrus O. writes, For two years I have been sending a copy of my paper, The Palladium and Observer, to President Cleveland. Although I have criticized his administration editorially several times, I have done so with the best of motives and certainly for his good. If he was angry with me for this, he surely has never so expressed himself to me. But last August I sent him a bill for the paper covering two years and over, and he has not answered my letter up to this date. Will you answer this through the columns of the Daily News telling me what I had better do, and so that others who may be in the same fix can understand what your advice would be in such a case? Response? Stop his paper. By all means, deprive him of the paper. You should have done so before, then you will feel perfectly free to criticize his administration to the bitter end. Nothing startles a president any more than to shut off a paper that he has become attached to. Mr. Cleveland will go out and paw around in the wet grass in front of the White House, and finally he will go in wondering what has become of the Palladium and Observer. In a week or two he will remit and tell you to continue sending the paper. Do not criticize his administration too severely till you see whether or not he is going to remit. Early Rose, Mankato, Minnesota, writes, Is it proper to mark passages in a book of poems loaned to one by a young man in whom one feels an interest? Or should one be content with simply expressing one's admiration of certain passages in the book? Response? I think the latter plan would be preferable, Rose. I am sure that young ladies make a great mistake when they mark the earnest and impassioned passages in a book of poems belonging to another. I once loaned a book of poems written by a gentleman named Swinburne. In this book, Mr. Swinburne had several times expressed himself as being violently in love with all the works of nature, especially those people who differed with him in the matter of sex. He wrote so fluently and earnestly regarding the matter of love that I loaned the book to a young lady, hoping that she would take this as a vicarious expression of my sentiments. It was a costly book, and so when it came back with Mr. Swinburne's sentiments, emphasized by means of a blue pencil— and his earnest thoughts underscored with a crochet hook, punctuated with tears and stabbed with a hairpin, I regretted it very much. I was led to believe also, by rereading the book, that she was in the habit of perusing it at the breakfast table, and that she was a victim of the omelette habit. Do not mark a borrowed book unless you have more friends than you can avail yourself of. Savant, Tailholt, Indiana You can get Indian arrowheads now almost everywhere except on the frontier. A good handmade Indian arrowhead is now made in Connecticut, and the prices are not exorbitant. I believe that if you can get manufacturer's rates delivered on board the cars at New Haven, you can secure enough Indian arrowheads for $25 to fresco the sides of a house. See that the name of the manufacturer is burned in the shank of each. Response? You will have no more trouble in securing Indian skulls. The manufacture of Indian skulls has not arrived at that degree of perfection which we hope for it in the future. You can get an Indian skull made of celluloid now that looks quite nice and ghastly, 
or you can secure a bear's nose made of hard rubber with pores in it and little drops of perspiration standing out on it. These noses have been used with great success in securing bounty in the New England states, and several counties in Maine have a large stock of rubber bear noses on which they have paid large bounties and which they would now sell at a great sacrifice. Aztec pottery excavated from old mounds in the southwest can now be purchased in any large city or made to order at the leading potteries of the country. Niagarn Plumber, to Tulos Crossing, Tennessee, asks, Is it proper to use the following expression which was made in our colored debating society three weeks ago? If you will answer this inquiry, you will confer a blessing on two young ladies who's got a bet up on the question. The expression we agreed upon was as follows. He's entitled to pay me for them pair of license. I claim that the word them should be those, while my friend Miss Bonisette Jackson says that the sentence is correct. Which is incorrect? Response? Where both have done so well, it is hard to say which is the more incorrect. I will withhold my opinion till your debating society puts in an evening devoted to the discussion of this question. Please let me know when it will occur, as I would like to be there. Etiquette, Chicago, Illinois, asks, Will you answer through the columns of the Daily News what remedy you would prescribe for the great nuisance, while traveling, of being compelled to wait all the forenoon for the female fiend who monopolizes one end of the sleeping car half the time and the other end of the car the other half? I am a lady, and nothing tends to discourage my efforts in trying to continue such like this constant contact with the average female brute who bolts herself into the ladies' dressing room in a sleeper and remains there all the forenoon, calcimining her purple nose and striving to beautify her chaotic features. Do tell us what you would suggest. Response? That is a question I have been called upon to settle before, but I am still worrying over it. I do not think we ought to fritter away our time on the tariff and other remote matters until we have, once for all, met and settled this vital question which lies so near to every heart. I have seen a large woman take her teeth in one hand and a shawl strap full of hair in the other and adjourn to the ladies' dressing room at Camp Douglas and finally emerge therefrom with a smooch of prepared chalk over each eye at Winona. All that time, half a dozen ladies in the car gnawed their under lips and tried to look happy. I have known a timid young lady to lose her breakfast because this same ogress with bristles along the back of her neck, as usual, moved into the dressing room and lived there till the train reached its destination and the dining car was detached. Some day this dressing room will be made on the plan of a large concertina, operated by means of clockwork, and after this venerable hyena has laundered herself and primped and beautified and upholstered herself and waxed her mustache, and insulted the plate-glass mirror for an hour or two by constantly compelling it to reflect her features, the walls of the apartment will gradually approach each other, and when that woman is removed she will look like the Battle of Gettysburg. End of chapter 32。Chapter 33 of Bill Nye's Cordwood。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by LT. Bill Nye's Cordwood by Bill Nye. Chapter 33. Mr. Sweeney's Cat Robert Ormsby Sweeney is a druggist of St. Paul, and though a recent chronological record reveals the fact that he is a direct descendant of a sure enough king, and though there is mighty good purple royal blood in his veins that dates back where kings used to have something to do to earn their salary, he goes right on with his regular business, selling drugs at the great sacrifice which druggists will make sometimes in order to place their goods within the reach of all. As soon as I learned that Mr. Sweeney had barely escaped being a crowned head, I got acquainted with him and tried to cheer him up, and told him that people wouldn't hold him in any way responsible, and that, as it hadn't shown itself in his family for years, he might perhaps finally wear it out. He's a mighty pleasant man anyhow, and you could have just as much fun with him as you could with a man who didn't have any royal blood in his veins. You would be with him for days on a fishing trip and never notice it at all. But I was going to speak more in particular of Mr. Sweeney's cat, Mr. Sweeney had a large cat named Dr. Mary Walker, of which he was very fond. Dr. Mary Walker remained at the drug store all the time, and was known all over St. Paul as a quiet and reserved cat. If Dr. Mary Walker took in the town after office hours, nobody seemed to know anything about it. 
she would be around bright and cheerful the next morning and attend to her duties at the store just as though nothing whatever had ever happened one day last summer mr sweeney left a large plate of fly paper with water on it in the window hoping to gather in a few quarts of flies in a deceased state dr mary walker used to go to this window during the afternoon and look out on the busy street while she called up pleasant memories of her past life that afternoon she thought she would call up some more memories so she went over on the counter and from there jumped down on the window sill landing with all four feet in the plate of fly paper at first she regarded it as a joke and treated the matter very lightly but later on she observed that the fly paper stuck to her feet with great tenacity of purpose those who have never seen the look of surprise and deep sorrow that a cat wears when she finds herself glued to a whole sheet of fly paper cannot fully appreciate the way dr mary walker felt she did not dash wildly through a hundred and fifty dollar plate glass window as some cats would have done she controlled herself and acted in the coolest manner though you could have seen that mentally she suffered intensely she sat down a moment to more fully outline a plan for the future in doing so she made a great mistake the gesture resulted in gluing the flypaper to her person in such a way that the edge turned up behind her in the most abrupt manner and caused her great inconvenience someone at that time laughed in a coarse and heartless way and i wish you could have seen the look of pain that dr mary walker gave him when she went away she did not go around the prescription case as the rest of us did but strolled through the middle of it and so on out through the glass door at the rear of the store we did not see her go through the glass door but we found pieces of fly paper and fur on the ragged edges of a large aperture in the glass and we kind of jumped at the conclusion that dr mary walker had taken that direction in retiring from the room dr mary walker never returned to st paul and her exact whereabouts are not known though every effort was made to find her fragments of fly paper and brindle hair were found as far west as the yellowstone national park and as far north as the british line but the doctor herself was not found my own theory is that if she turned her bow to the west so as to catch the strong easterly gale on her quarter with the sail she had set and her tail pointing directly toward the zenith the chances for dr mary walker's immediate return are extremely slim End of chapter 33chapter thirty four of bill nye's cordwood this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org recording by l t bill nye's cordwood by bill nye chapter thirty four bill nye's letter the humorist writes from his winter resort in his usually happy vein on various topics Asheville, North Carolina. As soon as I saw in the papers that my health was failing, I decided to wing my way south for the winter, so I closed up my establishment at Slippery Elmhurst, told the gamekeeper not to monkey with the preserves, and came here where I am now writing. At first it seems odd to me that I should be writing from here where I am now, but the more I think it over the better I am reconciled to it, for what better place can a man select from which to write a letter than the point where he is located at the time? Asheville is an enterprising cosmopolitan city of six or seven thousand people and a visiting population during the season of sixty thousand more. It is situated in the picturesque valley of the French Brood and between the Blue Ridge and the Alleghanies. Asheville is the metropolis of western North Carolina and has no competition nearer than Knoxville, Tennessee, one hundred and sixty miles away, and in fact not competing in any way with Asheville, for it is in another county altogether. This region of country is from 2,000 to 7,000 feet above sea level, and is in fact a mountain region with a southern exposure. Strange stories are told here of people who came 5, 10, 20 or more years ago with the view of dying here, but who afterward decided to live on, and they are living yet. One man who was a survivor of the Samso Philistine War, if I'm not mistaken, came here at last from the mouth of the Amazon, full of malaria. He had been kind of down in the mouth of the amazon for some years and they say his liver looked like a rubber doormat and his skin was like the cover of a sun-kissed ham he picked up his spirits here and recovered his youth and though he was very old when he came he's still older now and is in pretty good health i went to see him the other day he's so old there is moss on the north side of him and hieroglyphics on his feet when i made some facetious remarks to him and told him a story i had recently acquired he brightened up a good deal and emitted a dry cackling laugh like a xylophone 
and said that he believed he enjoyed that story just as well as he did when they used to tell it in the rifle pits in front of Troy. He said he liked Asheville very much indeed. Asheville is called the Switzerland of America. It has been my blessed privilege during the past twenty years to view nearly all the Switzerlands of America that are here, but this is fully the equal, if not the superior, of any of them. You can climb to the top of Bowcatcher Mountain to see a beautiful sight in any direction, and on most any day of the year. Everywhere the eye rests on a broad sweep of dark blue climate, up in the gorges, under the whispering pines, along the rhododendron-bordered margins of the Swanonoa, or the French brood. Out through the gap and down the thousand mountain brooks, you will find enough climate in twenty minutes to last a week. The chief products of western North Carolina are smoking tobacco and climate. If you do not like the climate, you can keep yourself to the smoking tobacco. Here you will find old Mr. Ozone with his coat off and a feather duster in his hand, prepared to dust the cobwebs from the catacombs of the asthmatic or the consumptive. There is enough climate wasted here every year to supply a city the size of Chicago. Moreover, there is now a handsome hotel here called the Battery Park, that has been full ever since it was built, and you can get good saddle horses, carriages, or donkeys at a reasonable rate in town. The donkey is quite a feature of this country, as he is apt to be in all mountain countries, in fact. I have never associated with a more genial urbane or refined donkey than we have here. He is generally a soft mouse color, about nine hands high, and delights in making small, elongated footprints on the sands of time. This small animal of the mountains is frequently accompanied by a robust but poorly modulated voice. It is very pathetic and generally needs a little oil on it. The North Carolina donkey, like the Colorado burro, lives to a great age. He then dies. Asheville has splendid waterworks supplying first-class water to those who wish to use this popular fluid. Electric lights all over the city. A street railway organized with its money put up to construct it next summer. First-class churches, schools and colleges, well-supplied markets with moderate prices, and lots of genuine attractions beside the climate. Fuel and whiskey are about the same as they are in Chicago, so a man need not suffer here provided he has a moderate income. The sportsman may sport here with impunity, and the angler may also triangular relaxation. Moonshine whiskey is also produced here in the mountains, though in a crude way and very quietly. None of the moonshiners advertise much in the papers. They do not care for a big run of trade, but seem content to remain in obscurity. Sometimes, however, their work attracts the attention of prominent people who come out and call on them with shotguns and regrets. Then the moonshiner does his distillery up in a napkin and goes away in the primeval forest. Some years ago, a party of revenue officers hunted out one of these amateur distillers and chased him up the side of the mountain, where they surrounded and captured him with his distillery on his back, like a Babcock fire extinguisher and still warm. The officer, in his report of capture, referred to it as a still hunt, whereupon his commission was promptly revoked. The man who tries to have any fun with the present administration must have his resignation where he can put his hand on it at a moment's warning. End of chapter 34「Chapter 35 of Bill Nye's Cordwood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Bill Nye's Cordwood by Bill Nye. Chapter 35 Declined with Thanks. Bill Nye politely refuses the job of King of Bulgaria. He gives his reasons for the declination and throws in chunks of heavy weight advice. Advisability of forming a royal trades union. Bill Nye has furnished to the world the following copy of a cable dispatch just forwarded to the Allied powers of Europe. Slippery Elmhurst, Hudson, Wisconsin. To the Allied powers, care of Lord Salisbury. Gentlemen, your favor of recent date regarding my acceptance of the Bulgarian throne, which is now vacant and for rent, in which note you tender me the use of said throne for one year with the privilege of three, is at hand. You also state that the Allied powers are not favorable to Prince Nicholas, and that you would prefer a dark horse. Looking over the entire list of obscure men, it would seem you have been unable to fix upon a man who has made a better showing in this line than I have. While I thank you for this kind offer of a throne that has, as you state, been newly refitted and refurnished throughout, 
I must decline it for reasons which I will try to give in my own rough, unpolished way. In the first place, I read in the dispatches today that Russia is mobilizing her troops, and I do not want anything to do with a country that will treat its soldiers in that way. Troops have certain rights as well as those who have sought the pleasanter walks of peace. That is not all. I do not care to enter into a squabble in which I am not interested. Neither do I care to go to Bulgaria in the capacity of a carpet-bag monarch from the ten-cent counter wearing a boiler iron overcoat by day, and a stab-proof corset at night. I have always been in favor of Bulgaria's selection of a monarch viva voce, or vox populi, whichever you think would look the best in print. I hate to see a monarch in hot water all the time and threatening to abdicate. Supposing he does abdicate, what good will that do when he leaves a widow with nothing but a second-hand throne and a crown two sizes too small for his successor? I have always said, and I still say, that nothing can be more pitiful than the sight of a lovely queen whose husband, in a wild frenzy of remorse, has abdicated himself. Nothing, I repeat, can be sadder than this picture of a deserted queen, left high and dry without means, forced at last to go to the pawnbrokers with a little plated, fluted crown with rabbit-skin ear-tabs on it. We are prone to believe that a monarch has nothing to do but issue a ukaz or a mandamus, and that he will then have all the funds he wants. But such is not the case. Lots of our most successful monarchs are liable to be overtaken any year by a long, cold winter, and found as late as Christmas reigning in their summer scepters. I am inclined also to hesitate about accepting the Bulgarian throne for another reason. I do not care to be deposed when I want to do something else. I have had my deposition taken several times, and it did not look like me either time. I think that you monarchs ought to stand by each other more. If you would form a society of free and independent monarchs there in Europe, where you are so plenty, you could have a good time and every little while you could raise your salaries if you worked it right. Now you pull and haul each other all the time and keep yourselves in hot water day and night. That's no way for a dynasty any more than for anyone else. It impairs your usefulness and fills our telegraphic columns full of names that we cannot pronounce. Every little while we have to pay the operator at this end of the cable ten dollars for writing in a rapid flowing hand that meanwhile Russia will continue to disregard the acts of the Sobranje. Why should a great country like Russia go about trying to make trouble with a low-priced Sobranje? I think that a closer alliance of crowned heads whose interests are identical would certainly relieve the monotony of many a long, tedious reign. If I were to accept the throne of Bulgaria, which is not likely, so long as my good right arm can still jerk a fluent cross-cut saw in the English tongue, I would form a syndicate of monarchs with grips, passwords, explanations, and signals. Every scepter would have a contralto whistle in the butt end which could be used as a sign of distress, while the other end could have a cork in it, and then steering a tottering dynasty down through the dim vista of crumbling centuries would not be so irksome as it now is. As it is now, three or four allied powers ask a man to leave his business and squat on a cold hard throne for a mere pittance and then just as he begins to let his whiskers grow and learns to dodge a big porcelain bomb those same allied powers jump on top of him all spraddled out and ask him for his deposition that is no way to treat an amateur monarch who is trying to do right you can see that unless you stand by each other the thrones of europe will soon be empty and every two-dollar-a-day hotel in America will have an heir apparently to the throne for a head waiter, with a coronet put on his clothes with a rubber stamp and a loaded scepter up his sleeve. If you want to rear your children to love and respect the monarchy industry, you must afford them better protection. I say this as a man who may not live to be over one hundred years of age, and with my feet thus settling in to the boggy shores of time, let me beg of you, monarchs and monarchesses, to make your calling an honorable one. Teach your children and their children to respect the business by which their parents earn their bread. Show them it is honorable to empire a country if they do it right. 
teach them that to do right is better than to fraudulently turn a jack from the bottom of the pack. Teach them it is better to be a popular straight out-and-out -out artisan king who is sincere about it than to be a monarch who dares not leave his throne night or day for fear that somebody will put a number of bombs under it or criticize him in the papers. End of chapter 35 End of Bill Nye's Cordwood by Bill Nye Recording by Philip Gould